How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, and there is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. God, we just want to come before you this morning. And God, we want to submit ourselves to you. God, we pray that as we read these hard words that the prophet Habakkuk said to you, God, that you would minister to us in our own hearts, in our own lives. And if we're not in a place where those words are applicable today, that we would store those up for a time when they might be. That we would remember them to comfort someone that we know who's in need. And Father, I just pray that, um, that you would speak through me today. That you would um, not let anything come out of my mouth that's not from you. And that you would speak to your people who you love in a way that would help us to grow in our faith, Lord, today. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Have any of you ever felt like that from that reading from Habakkuk? Have you ever felt like that you were crying out to God, but he couldn't hear you? Have you ever looked at all of the injustice and violence in the world and asked God, why is this happening? Maybe it's a diagnosis or a series of events outside of your control. And you just don't understand why. Maybe it's a broken relationship that's because of your own sin, but you've repented and you're trying to make things right, but nothing's working. And it seems like everything is falling apart. Well, this series is called Hope in the Dark, and we're going to be looking at the book of Habakkuk. When uh, Chris and I were first talking about that, I know that at some point in seminary, I did a paper on the book of Habakkuk but I'm not going to lie, I had trouble finding it in my Bible, okay? It's at the end of the Old Testament. This is a prophet. This is one of the, the prophets in the Old Testament were the ones who usually went on behalf. Um, God would speak to them, and he would say, here's what's going on. Go talk to the people and tell them they need to repent and turn back to me. That's mostly, that's what happened mostly with the prophets in the Old Testament. But Habakkuk was different because he actually went to God on behalf of the people. And the book of Habakkuk starts out with those words that I read to you. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen? That's how he starts out his conversation with God. Now, you just got to know that today is not like a, a Sunday school sermon. This is a, this is, we're, we're going to be into some deep stuff today. And that's why I'm praying this whole week, and even in knowing that we were going to get to teach this series, that God would just really speak to you wherever you're at today. Because I know we've come into this room, and there's a lot of different needs. There's a lot of different things going on. And I think 20 years ago, I might not have understood this sermon in the same way that I do now after going through the darkest time of my life. And so I pray that wherever you're at today, that God will really minister to you through these words of the prophet um, Habakkuk and through this book as we're delving into this. Um, so um, this is a series that's from a church called Life Church, and I know you guys, well, even if you don't know it, 
you have been impacted by Life Church because Pastor Chris and I have been impacted by Life Church. And their pastor, Craig Rochelle, has been a great influence in our lives. He came to our conferences that we hosted when we were on staff at a church in Dallas. And we have loved and respected he and his wife and the, with the really amazing character in the way that they live their lives, their marriage, the way they raise their six children, um, how they have had such a heart to give away all of their resources. They've started... Um, uh, a thing for pastors where they just give away everything and they enc- encourage other churches to give away their stuff too. So churches like us that don't have um, a, a, a team of people on staff can use the videos and the graphics and the songs and all of the creative things for free. So yeah, the most important thing that you guys know from Life Church, whether you know it or not, is the Version app. Now, Pastor Craig Rochelle was greatly impacted and really um, had one of his first encounters with Jesus reading a Bible that was given by the Gideons. You know the Bibles that are in hotel rooms? Those are freely given. That was like a mission of theirs to do that. And so because of that, he really wanted to make it on a more global scale where everyone could be able to access the Word of God for free. And so He employs a team of people at his church that offer, that make the YouVersion app available for free to us. And so there are millions, right? There's over, how many people? 300 million people. And you can get all the versions. If you don't have YouVersion, I would really encourage you guys to download it today. It's free. It's an amazing app. It's Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N. And you can search um, and look up scriptures. They have reminders for a scripture of the day. And there's actually a study that we would love for you to participate that they've written to go along with this series over the next three weeks. So it's a 12-day study. So if you want to do that right now, you can start doing that. We'll talk about it again in the announcements, but I just want to, it's really important, so I want to tell you how to do it. So you go to your Google store, your Apple store, um, and it's called YouVersion, Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N. You download that for free, and in there, you can look up plans, okay? There's a button that says plans, and if you click on plans... There's a little search tab right up at the top, that little search icon, and you type in there, hope in the dark. I love that they don't put their, they've written this, and they provide all these um, uh, devotionals for people, and they don't put theirs as the first thing that comes up when you type in hope. You'd think you were going to put your name first in the search bar, right? No. You have to type in all the way hope in the dark before you find it. They're not trying to get it promoted over other people's stuff. So when you click on that, it says 12 days, and then you can press start the plan. And uh, we'd love for you to do that. There's a short devotional, and there are some scriptures to read every day for the next three weeks. And so as we lean into this together and as we seek to build our faith together, this is just going to be another tool that um, we're really going to be able to, um, to utilize together as a church to be reading this and studying this together. Um, so this idea for this series um, from Craig Rochelle was uh, written originally because he had a staff member um, who lost a baby, and it was someone who was really important to him and, and his family, and so he wrote a book called Hope in the Dark. It wasn't a book. He just wrote this huge, like, when he was trying to process through for her, of praying for her, and he wrote this huge, like, 100-page thing to give to this woman that he loved, that he and his family were close to, and so... Um, he put it in a drawer and didn't think about it again. You know, he gave it to her, and it was helpful for her family. Um, but then uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, his um, second daughter of their six children, two, um, just a couple of weeks right before her wedding, she's 21 years old, and she was about to get married, and she got a severe case of mono. Um, but since then, she has not gotten any better. So she went ahead and got married, 
um, but she has had a debilitating illness, and she's been in and out of doctor's appointments. And if you follow him on Instagram or social media, He's been asking for prayers over the last two years for Mandy. Mandy herself is an amazing woman of God. I also follow her on social media and have been really impacted by her story. She was going and even at 20 years old, speaking with Christine Kane and um, had this huge promising future and just the most sweetest, innocent, beautiful girl who loves Jesus. And all of a sudden she has this illness and the doctors can't figure out what it is. I think even this last week they might have said that they found that they think it could be chronic fatigue syndrome. But she she can't stand up. She's so weak. And she's this newly married, beautiful girl who loves Jesus. And he has been crying out to God. And he said, I thought of this, this like letter, this thing that I had written for our staff person. And I got it back out to read to myself. And it was really impactful to him. And so um, as we've been following along with this journey, as, as we've been praying for Mandy, it has been um, just something that's been on our hearts of how do we, um, how do we help our church family to look and to cling to hope when they are in the dark? And that's something that Chris and I have been really, um, you know, we've we've wrestled with it in our own lives, um, but we've also really wrestled with it in a way of how can we as a church lean into that together. And so this whole message series, um, we're so thankful to to be able to um, partner with with Life Church and and to do this together with them. And I, we know it's impacting so many people, and we pray that it'll impact us um, today. Okay, a lot of us go along. We're going to talk about our spiritual life and our spiritual journey and how it happens for a lot of people. There's a great Bible study by Henry Blackaby called Experiencing God, and he sort of talks about this. You know, many times those of us who, you know, we don't know who Jesus is, and maybe we have this amazing encounter where we turn our lives over to Jesus, right? Like, so we're going along down here and we turn our lives over to Jesus and we feel like the whole world of opportunities are open to us. Um, maybe we, you know, experience a, a big surge of joy and we're, we're, we're just moving up. We feel like, you know, um, uh, I, I was listening to, to someone say this. They were like, you know, they feel like they go to church and the message is just for them. It's like the perfect message that they needed to hear. And the worship was amazing. And they get in the car and it's their favorite song. And then they go and get the parking spot at the grocery store. And they don't have to wait in line. And all the birds are singing and everything is wonderful. And work's going great. And relationships are going great. And they're so happy and they feel good. And they're sleeping great. And they just feel like like, wow, this whole Christian thing is, this is amazing, right? And they're up here on this mountaintop, and they're like, oh, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And, and then, you know, all of a sudden they're going along for a while, maybe a good long while, I don't know. And, uh, and then, you know, just some things start to happen. They go to the church service, the message is like, mm. You know, the worship's like, mm, this is off today. You know, you hate the song that's on when you get in your car. There's no parking place. People are mean at the store. Work's going bad. Relationships break up. Everything's like, oh, you know, it's just kind of like, oh, this, what is happening here, right? And then sometimes right around in one of those times, something big happens. Like maybe there's a diagnosis. Maybe there's a, a broken relationship that just cripples you. Maybe there's a, a loss of job or a financial burden that just seems like it is too heavy to bear. Maybe it's just that everything feels like it's falling apart in your life. Maybe your daughter's sick and you can't figure out why God won't heal her. Maybe like my cousin and his wife last year, your three-month-old baby dies because 
a negligent worker laid her on her stomach on a couch and she suffocates. And at this spot, Henry Blackaby calls this spot a crisis of belief. And most people think when you get to a place where you have a crisis of belief that you can only do one of two things, right? That you, you kind of go back up here and you deny that anything is wrong, okay? You're like, la, 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 everything is fine, I'm okay. Or you start to go in this direction where you deny God, okay? And those are the, the two options I think that most of us think that there is. And this is the time where Henry, Henry Blackaby says that most Christians fall away from their faith. It's when they experience their first crisis of belief. And they say, this is, how could a good God allow this to happen? We hear about this all the time, right? We hear about people saying, I just, you know, that happened with my dad and I prayed and then, you know, God didn't do anything. And I thought, how could God exist if that happens? And I just decided I don't believe in him and I'm staying here and, and that's, that's the choice I've made. Some people may not fully go out and say that, but they live practically like it's true because they're so angry and so bitter and they've just continued in that way that they've denied that God could have anything good that could ever come from that. Or we pretend that there's nothing wrong and we, this is, you know, I'm like pro at that right there. Everything's great until you get to a place where you can't deny that anymore, right? So what if there's a third option? I think the book of Habakkuk tells us that there's a third option. Okay, you know the name Habakkuk is this um, is this weird word, and and scholars really disagree about what it means. But there's sort of this idea that the word Habakkuk is like this kind of weird holding on to that's like a wrestling and an embracing. Okay, and so what if that's our third option to wrestle and embrace? to wrestle with God and ask those questions and say, why is this happening? But to embrace and not let go of him in the process, to hold on tightly, even in the dark, to hold on tightly, even when we can't see what the future might hold, to hold on tightly when we may never understand on this side of eternity why some things are the way that they are. To wrestle and embrace. And that is going to be the main thing that I want you to walk away with today is that it is okay to wrestle with God. Just don't let go. It is okay to wrestle with God, but don't let go. Hold on. Embrace. Have a tight hold. Have you seen that in the movies where the woman gets terrible news and she goes to hug someone and she's, she's hitting them while she's crying and she's holding on to them? Wrestle, but don't let go. Hold on. I was thinking about in my life, when I've experienced, I was thinking, when have I experienced a crisis of belief? Is that how you spell crisis? That looks weird. Okay. You know, sometimes when you write something on a blackboard, it's like, oh, that doesn't look right. Okay. So in my own life, um, you know, I think there was a time where I was really confused about some of the things that I was hearing in the church. You know, I went to a church growing up where um, when my parents divorced, um, I felt like that I had like a scarlet letter, that I was a sinner, that I was not welcome there anymore. I felt so much shame from the people in that church. 
about that as a kid growing up. And that was really confusing to me because I really felt like that Jesus loved me. And I really felt like that he had died for me. Like I had an understanding of his forgiveness in my life. But the church, it was a little bit confusing the message that I got from them. Same thing when I went off to university and I started going to a, um, a, a Bible study class and they were talking about stuff in the Bible and they were like, oh, the Bible, you know, the Bible doesn't say that it's a sin to drink. They just say it's a sin to not get drunk. It's not a sin to drink. And I was like, what? They've been lying to me my whole life. <laughs> my whole life I thought it was a sin to dance. I thought it was a sin to touch alcohol. I'm like, oh, so they lied about everything. They're just trying to help me be a generally good moral person. But that's not what the Word of God says. Well, so I had to, like, start reading the Word of God for myself. And what does it say? And, you know, they had good reasons for doing that. They were trying to protect me. And uh, I don't I don't think there were good reasons for making a 10-year-old kid feel shame over their parents getting a divorce. But, you know, we're, here's the thing about the church. We are flawed people, and we mess up. Our prayer all the time is with Chris and I, with our own flaws, with our own sin that we have in our life, that that doesn't ever come through and, and, and impose on any of you. But we are flawed people. And the best advice I can give you of being a part of a church family is you get deep into this word of God on your own. You are able to, because of what Jesus did for us, have a direct relationship. You don't need to go through Chris or I to have a connection to your loving Father. And God will speak to you in that, and He will heal. He will help heal the things that we as a church have messed up on because we, have, we are not perfect. But that's the beauty of the church. I can't believe that God calls us to be together knowing that we're all going to be messed up, knowing that we're all going to wrestle, knowing that we're all going to have hard times. But he says, still, it's community. Gather together. Don't give up on that. Don't give up on it. Don't walk away from the church. Don't walk away from God because he loves us. He, he's there for us, right? Right? And so that's one time where I think there was a, a crisis of belief um, in my life. And, and during that time, there was a, you know, uh, a lot of prayer, a lot of reading God's word. But the real time that I think about, because uh, was a, was a, when I had a crisis of belief, was at a time where you wouldn't think that a person would have a crisis of belief. Chris and I had been in ministry um, I had, I had been in ministry at that time for 12 or 13 years. At this point, I was counting up these numbers. I have been called um, to work in the church for 19 years. I'm not that old. I mean, that is so crazy. It's a real strong calling that God's given me in my life. Um, and I'm, I'm really, there's nothing I'd rather do. There is nothing I would rather do with my life than to serve God and to love his people and to help build the kingdom of God through the local church because I believe in it. I love it. And um, when God asked us to leave Dallas, the church um, that we were at there, and to come to Montreal and to start City Church, I mean, we were, we were so willing. We felt, and Chris talked a little bit about that um, last week, about how even some things in that were, it was like, okay, we're, we're doing this. But that doesn't mean when you're following God's plan that everything magically falls into place for you. There's something about that wrestling. There's something about that struggling that builds faith and character, right? Oh, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Where is that? Hmm? Is that in James? Yes, James. I'll just read it right now because I just said it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so we... um. We moved here, and we had lived here uh, about a year when I had um, 
I don't know if we even realized it at the time, but definitely it's so clear looking back on it, but just a debilitating depression where I couldn't get out of bed. And uh, I feel like I had always had such joy and such energy in my life, and it just confused us. I mean, we didn't even know what was going on. But it felt like it took over my whole life. And I'll tell you what, that is not what I was expecting when I surrendered my life to come and do ministry in Montreal. That's not what I thought my reward would be. (laughs) And uh, it didn't get better for a long time. As a matter of fact, it got worse. Because we didn't know what was going on, and I had turned into like a different person, and we had no idea. Our marriage was in the worst place that it's ever been. We had a really hard time in our marriage, our relationship. My identity of how I saw myself was completely turned upside down because I couldn't pull myself up by my bootstraps as a good Texas girl has been raised to do. And I could not do it. I couldn't get out of bed. And then I got really sick. <laughs> Went to the doctor. They're like, oh, you have no iron in your iron stores. They're doing all these tests. They still couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Um, my body wasn't absorbing any nutrients. It was months of hospital visits. And so when I say that I've had a crisis of belief, that's what I I think of as that several year period in my life. And all of that really caused me to question the goodness of God. Because that was coming off the death of two of my friends in Dallas, my very best friends. And I just was like, God, how are you allowing this to happen? How is this a part of your plan? And, you know, I'd love to get up here and say to you, you know, uh, here's the four ways to get through that. You know, here's all you need to know um, if you're in that place today. But I just don't think real life is like that. And I think as a church, we try too often to say, you know, here's the, here's the fix to what you're going through. When I think a huge part of the process is this word right here. And I really had to, for the first time in my life, wrestle with my faith. Do I really believe what I say I believe? And I'll tell you what, I I can, I, I, I would think, oh Lord, please don't let me, surely you didn't bring me all the way up here for me to walk away from my faith. Is that, is that what's gonna happen? Are you, are you real? Are you there? Do you hear me? Do you see me? And I'm so thankful there are people who did not give up on me during that time. I'm thankful that I had a foundation of God's word and years of him proving himself faithful to me over and over again. But there was just some little point, and I can remember it. I can remember where I was sitting. And it was, I think that's why I cry every time we sing the song, um, Come Thou Fount. Because it talks about, let my heart, Lord, like a tether, bind my wandering heart to thee. You know what a tether is? It's like a one little, I picture like the tiniest little line. So my heart's out here wondering. This is wondering. This wrestling and embracing is a time of wondering, of asking why. Our hearts are wondering. Our hearts are prone to wonder, to wander. Um, And we can ask the questions and wonder why, God, why. But there's that binding. And that was the prayer that I had. I didn't know if I was still tethered to God or not. But you know what I realized? I wanted to be. 
I wanted to still be connected to him. Even in the darkest, deepest moments where I didn't feel him and I didn't see him. And you know what? That is enough. It's enough even if you're not sure. God can handle your uncertainty. He can handle your questions. God is big enough for that. You look in the Bible at all the questions that David asked God, that Job asked God. There are whole books in Lamentations where God's people are asking him, why is this happening? He is big enough for our questions. And it is okay to ask God questions. I would just implore you to wrestle with God, but don't let go. To wrestle, but not to walk away. Because even though you go down in here, this is the valley right here, right? You're down in the valley of the shadow of death. God is with you, even when you don't see him, even when it's dark. He is still there. And if you can find a place to still have faith in him, that is what faith really is, people. That is what faith is. It's when we can't see him. If everything is good and we're up here and the songs are playing and the sun is shining and the birds are singing, that's not real faith. That faith has not been tested. This is where you decide and discover if you have real faith. It's during the valley. And you know what else I know from growing up in farming community? There's not a lot of farms and stuff that are built on mountaintops. You know why? Because stuff grows in the valley. And so do we. We grow in the valley. As a matter of fact, there's this, um, this uh, uh, one of the things that I read, um, one of the newer things that I read about Habakkuk's name um, said something about that he was a... Um, that it was like a a, a plant. And I I thought, well, that's interesting to throw that in with like the wrestling and embracing. They were like, oh, there's this one document that's been found where that was, that name was used during that time and it meant something like a plant. And and then I was trying, I was thinking about that. And then my friend Vicki sent me this uh, picture that says, sometimes when you're in a dark place, you sometimes tend to think you've been buried. Perhaps you've been planted. It's really dark when you have been buried. It's really dark when you feel like that all of, uh, of, the, of the things that, um, that, that sort of drew you in and, and gave you joy are stripped away. But it is in this valley that our faith is tested and that we grow. That's one of my favorite quotes that I have is that all of us are broken, and some of us grow strong in the broken places. And so that's what I'm praying for you, for us, that we would grow strong in our broken places, that we would rally together in the valley, and that we would be okay with each other's questions of why, that we would continue to lean into that, So maybe, just maybe, that doubt is where our faith can grow stronger. That in the dark, that in the valley, that that's where our faith can grow. And Chris is going to continue to talk about this the next couple of weeks. He's going he's to be teaching on chapters 2 and 3. We've just covered a little bit of chapter one in Habakkuk. And um, I got to tell you, it really doesn't get a lot better in chapter two. It gets worse. But we're going to continue to lean into that together. We're going to continue to fight and to hope in the dark. And right now I'm going to ask the band to come forward because we're going to sing a song And this song, this song was written by the Life Church worship team, and they wrote it 
for Mandy and for their family. And we, we can't find a chart to it anywhere. Like we heard it on Instagram and uh, because the, the Life Church band went over to um, their house and sang it for her. But it has so ministered to me since I've heard it. And it is, um, I think the words have tapped into something that's a longing in all of our hearts. That's a, that's a deep, deep um, need and desire and addresses that, that time of that crisis of belief. That maybe these words today that we're going to sing especially when we get to the bridge where it says, I will lift my hands while I'm waiting. Louder than my fears, I will sing. And may my heart ever be reminded, you are good, you are good. And so as we sing this, wherever you're at today, maybe you're not at a place where you are ready to say, God, you are good, and I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to sing this out. Because maybe you're really, you really don't, believe that today if you were honest with yourself maybe you've been in the thing of trying to pretend that everything's okay but maybe there's a part of you that you can recognize way down in there that wants to be tethered to that belief that wants to believe that God is good Hold on to that. You wrestle with that, but don't let go. So however you feel comfortable in this next song, we invite you to um, sing with us or just allow us to sing it over you. When I feel lost in the dark And all of these fears surround my heart I know you see me I know you're with me Jesus, you are When I am caught in the lies and I can't see the other side still you are near me you never fail me Jesus you are good Jesus you are and it seems like the road is long help me to sing just one more song you are my healer you are the answer jesus you are You are 
are good, you are good, Jesus, you are. If you feel like you're able to today, and maybe you just want to do this in faith, would you just lift both of your hands up to God? you are 